Chapter 14, Restitution. I see a place where people get on and off the freeway, on and off, on and off, all day, all night. Soon, where Toontown once stood, will be a string of gas stations, inexpensive motels, restaurants that serve rapidly prepared food, tire salons, automobile dealerships, and wonderful, wonderful billboards reaching as far as the eye can see. My God, it will be beautiful. Judge Doom in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Nobody's going to drive this lousy freeway when they can take the red car for a nickel. Eddie Valiant, Judge Doom's nemesis. 14.1. Myths in Motion. In the 1920s, a General Motors subsidiary acquired streetcar systems in Springfield, Ohio, and Kalamazoo in Saginaw, Michigan. Contracts required the transit systems to buy only General Motors and NAC buses, Firestone tires, and fuels and lubricants from Standard Oil of California. In exchange, GM, Firestone, and Standard Oil provided the capital. In 1936, E. Roy Fitzgerald, a bus company operator who hauled miners in northern Minnesota, was made president of National City Lines, NCL, General Motors Transit Holding Company, controlled through General Motors bus units, Yellow Coach, and Greyhound. By 1946, NCL and its subsidiaries, American City Lines and Pacific City Lines, owned transit systems in 45 cities including the red car lines in Los Angeles and the key lines in Oakland. That same year, industry trade publication Mass Transportation named Fitzgerald Transportation Man of the Year. Fitzgerald also made the cover of the July 20, 1946 issue of Business Week as NCL became a publicly traded company on the New York Stock Exchange. On April 10, 1947, the United States Attorney General Tom Clark indicted nine corporations and seven individuals, including Fitzgerald, on antitrust charges of conspiracy and the sale of equipment to a nationwide combine of city bus lines. March 13, 1949, they were all convicted on one count of conspiring to monopolize a part of the trade and commerce of the United States. National City Lines and General Motors and the other companies were fined $5,000 apiece, while their managers were fined $1 each. It is important to rail transit advocates that they tell the story that America's streetcar system was done in by a conspiracy, because if it were a conspiracy rather than market forces or democratic preferences, it was a wrong to be righted by new investments in rail transit. Advocates tell this story in a number of forums, including the relatively widely seen documentary, Taken for a Ride. The Decline of Transit, a comparative study of the United States and Germany, posits a grand conspiracy to do away with transit by automobile and suburban development interests. At places, it states that the whole story had to do with finding employment for labor in a capitalistic society. Similarly, in the early 1970s, Bradford C. Snell charged that General Motors had used NCL to destroy thriving street railways in the interest of selling buses and, in the long run, automobiles. Snell's American Ground Transport was first published as a House Committee print. It was not limited to NCL. It charged GM with forcing the railroads to adopt its diesels and with aiding the Nazi government during World War II. Needless to say, Snell's charges garnered significant newspaper attention. Did a judge doom like General Motors do in the streetcar? or was the streetcar already doomed due to the general rise of the automobile and the greater flexibility of the bus? Fourteen point two deterioration. Rule three, invest in companies which are not dependent on high tariffs and would not suffer from European or Asiatic competition in the years ahead. Thoroughly reorganized traction company in a large city would qualify, while a textile company would not. Babson, 1948. Subway and elevated transit streetcars, passenger railroad service, and ferry service were deployed in large cities prior to the coming of the automobile, and by the late 1920s, the widespread use of the automobile in urban areas either brought the growth of ridership to an abrupt halt or turned it downward. Streetcar service was impacted hardest. Views of the problem had several ingredients. One was that suburban areas not served by transit required transit expansion. Otherwise, market shares could not be maintained. The figure shows long-term loss of market shares, though some recent modest gains after 30 years of concerted investments in rail. Another view said that the automobile was a superior vehicle, so transit vehicles of higher quality were needed. There were two responses to these views. One response was to deploy the bus. It could serve newly developing residential areas and serve as an economical substitute for streetcars on thinly traveled lines. Transit operators liked the bus because a one-man crew could be used. The bus was somewhat more maneuverable than the streetcar in traffic, and interruptions of power, fires on streets, and so on could be detoured. Additionally, many cities required that streetcar operators maintain the roadway occupied by streetcars 
an expensive endeavor and one disliked by transit operators because those facilities were used by automobiles. The other response was to develop a superior technology. The President's Conference Committee, PCC, streetcar resulted. The story of the PCC car is an interesting one. The Electric Railway President's Conference Committee was made up of the presidents of the large transit properties. It examined the situation and published reports and recommendations, most of which were ignored. Many of the ideas developed are topical today. For example, the idea of having downtown activities, landowners, subsidize CBD transit services. It was claimed that transit service resulted in a socially desirable urban form. The PCC undertook a design of a modern electric streetcar, the PCC car, which was built in small numbers just before World War II and in greater numbers just afterward. Several car builders were involved and overseas builders were licensed to use the technology. European designs deployed in the United States as light rail ventures from San Diego 1980 forward were second generation PCC cars. The PCC car was much improved over previous cars, better acceleration, quieter, better ventilated, better seats, stronger, and so forth. Yet it could not undo the reshaping of demand and competition from the automobile. The third perception of the transit problem sums is rationalization. In many cities, there were several properties operating competing services, and services were often not coordinated. Because the transit properties operated on franchises, matters of fares and service had often been politicized. Many properties were operated by electric utilities. Tackling these problems was the third challenge to transit planning. The rationalization issue was not new, of course, for consolidation of properties had been undertaken previously. The transit properties were mainly private properties, so often planning studies were undertaken by the property owners. But in many cases, problems were so blatant that municipalities sponsored studies. Also, the franchise fare and service leverage exercised by cities on the properties gave them a considerable involvement in problem solving. Many studies were made in the great men style during the 1920s and 1930s. One actor was Henry M. Brinkerhoff, who worked as an engineering manager in the transit industry in Chicago. During the 1910s, he was chief engineer of the Chicago Subway Commission, and he developed Chicago's consolidation plan. He subsequently worked in Detroit, Cleveland, Philadelphia, and a number of other cities. Considerations of a more policy planning strategic sort were treated by the American Electric Railway Association. Its publication, The Urban Transportation Problem, in 1932, reads very much like today's problems discussions. For instance, special assessment districts in downtown were proposed for transit funding. Using the criterion for success, did the plans accomplish what they set out to do? Transit planning worked pretty well. Buses replaced streetcars and offered service in suburban areas. The PCC car was quite a remarkable advance over previous technology. Rationalization was not as successful. In many places, properties were not consolidated and everywhere little progress was made on adjusting fares and service. The transit context was the problem. The properties were either losing market share, subways and elevated lines, or losing in an absolute fashion, bus, streetcar. The problem was to manage stasis or graceful decline, and we have four observations on that problem. First, we may observe that changes pose no special problems for individuals and institutions if the physical and psychological magnitudes of those changes are slight. For example, is the switch from the horse-drawn tram car to the cable car which involved a familiar technology and not much new knowledge. It did require some change in behavior on the part of institutions as the use of horses was phased out and new investments made and as new kinds of people were brought on board to operate the cable works. The change from the electric streetcar to the bus was also manageable. However, suppose that physical and psychological magnitudes are great. Consider the shift from the steam locomotive to the diesel. Traditional locomotive manufacturing had almost none of the relevant knowledge and it was unthinkable that something so different could replace the iron horse that built the railroads. Those manufacturers are no longer in business. The next three observations are also well known. We will follow Simon's wording of them. When an institution is not performing as well as it aspires to perform, search behavior is induced. The institution's level of aspiration drifts downward until it matches obtainable performance. But there is a catch. The level of aspiration may be so locked in by peer group values and traditions that it does not drift down easily. Search behavior may be fruitless or only marginally rewarding. The mechanisms causing performance to fall short of aspiration may continue in place, and declining aspirations chase ever-declining performance possibilities. So there may be a fast variable, slow variable situation where things get out of synchronization. If the latter situation holds, then the possibility of catastrophe looms. In the private sector, this may mean bankruptcy, depending upon the structure of competition.
in any circumstance, one observes rational adaptive behavior being pushed aside by apathy and or aggression. The transit industry seems to have maintained it. It's cool. It searched for new options, for example, the bus, the PCC car, lowered its aspirations and acted in a rational fashion. Today, however, it is the problem that concerned publics have high aspirations for it, save the city and eliminate congestion, among others. But those aspirations have not permeated the industry very deeply. Fourteen point three motorization. One by one, the properties began to substitute electric or motor buses for streetcars and into urban services gave way to bus services. Public policy actions enabled and often encouraged the shift from streetcars to buses. Policy allowed for some rationalization of properties and services, as well as fare adjustments. The industry muddled through the Great Depression. World War II saw great increases in ridership as employment increased and automobile production and use was discouraged. Many properties were flush with the cash at the end of the war. But it wasn't long after the war until trends dating from the 1920s again took hold. The fiscal problems of private operators called for out for public actions in the larger, older cities where the loss of transit services could not be tolerated. San Francisco, Chicago, New Orleans, New York, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and so on. And the cities began to take over services. The acuteness of problems, steps taken, and success in managing problems varied by venue. Seattle and San Francisco took over private services early on. Some cities took over step by step. Chicago, for example, took over subway elevated services first and bus and streetcar services later. In general, the cities undertook modest downsizing, fare rationalization, and other efforts to improve the matching of services to markets. They did not experiment with deregulation in a full sense. However, in the 1950s and 60s, quite a few services in the metropolitan areas continued to be privately operated typically providing a small number of niche services. Several key points can be drawn from a history that relate back to the conspiracy. First, while General Motors' National City Lines was a private venture that converted streetcars to buses, a number of other cities in which National City Lines was not a player did so as well. Some of these cities made conversions while the city government controlled the routes, others while they were in private hands. These other non-NCL cities did not always make quite as extensive a conversion but they did a conversion nonetheless. Evidence for this includes locales beyond the United States. For instance, London, which phased out double-decker electric streetcar and trolleybus lines for the ubiquitous double-decker motor buses that are world famous. Second, the PCC car was promoted by private companies as well. General Electric, Westinghouse, and St. Louis car were not non-entities in the business. If there was a good business to be made in selling modern streetcars, there were capitalists willing to give it a go. Third, the NCL organization was profitable for many years. General Motors entered the business to make money by selling buses, not to destroy transit to increase auto sales, which were on an independent trajectory and didn't need the assistance. While the business may not have been GM's most profitable, it was just an element of a large firm that diversified to spread risk and invest profits. Other GM subsidiaries at various times included appliances, Frigidaire, as well as bus, taxi, and rental car companies. The literature in the 1930s often refers to the saturation of the automobile market. That is now. There was interest in the industry in growing through diversification. Fourth, buses were at the time seen as the new and improved version of transit. Rational transportation planners comparing buses to streetcars would point to their flexibility, their ability to free ride on roads provided for other reasons. No maintenance of track or overhead electrical was necessary. The smoother ride, the ability to follow demand to the suburbs at relatively low cost, and so on. At worst, the NCL conspiracy accelerated a trend already in place. We judged that the matter was not a big thing in the decline of transit. The market was a strong force at work. NCL may have yielded minor returns to the GM bus business, but as a diversification step, it was not a very good idea. 14.3.1, Twin Cities Transit. While there is clearly some dispute as to the importance of a national conspiracy in the shift from streetcars to bus transit, one should not dismiss the existence of criminals in the streetcar companies of the era, like the rail era before them. A marked example is the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota. The streetcar lines in the Twin Cities were built by Tom Lowry in the 19th and early 20th centuries, and, as in many cities, were aimed in large part at land development. For the period between 1925 and 1948, fares held steady at 10 cents, leading to capital shortfalls. The Twin Cities lines were publicly traded and most shareholders were non-local. The conversion from streetcars to buses took place after a series of events helped drain the company of even more resources. In 1949, 
Charles Green undertook a hostile takeover. He asked for a fair hike, fired 25% of the workforce, and canceled capital investment. He was employing a traditional cash cow model wherein new owners milked the system of resources to pay for its own takeover. A strange turn took place when Isidore Blumenfeld, a.k.a. Kid Khan, rumored to be a gangster and murderer, and Fred Osana, known to be a lawyer, tried to take the system from Green. The State Railway Commission made an investigation of bribery, embezzlement, kickbacks, and death threats. Osana and company did successfully take over the Twin Cities Rapid Transit in 1951 and sold off the streetcars and many of the rails. It is reported that the vehicles are still running in New Jersey and in Mexico City, though while the shells may still operate, whether the mechanics in the vehicle do is unclear. Osana claimed the fastest and most massive streetcar to bus conversion ever undertaken in any major U.S. city. However, Osana wound up in jail for fraud. The system was subsequently sold to Carl Polad, later owner of the Minnesota Twins baseball team, and was eventually sold to the Public Metropolitan Transit Commission in 1970 for $7.9 million. Fourteen point four: Angels and Devils The conspiracy is clearly the most popular view of why transit failed. Milder devil theories have to do with tax subsidies for suburban family homes and subsidies for the automobile. Sometimes it is said that the mortgage insurance offered by the federal government influenced development, but such insurance was available for many kinds of residential development. One gets the impression that somehow the devil made otherwise good people make bad decisions about auto ownership and suburban development. Devil theories go a little ways, but end up as not very consequential. Angel theories give the same impression. We would be in heaven if smarter, better trained managers were hired, if new equipment were purchased, if new systems were developed, and so forth. A couple of cost-related angel theories are that transit is inherently less expensive than the auto alternative. Intuitive clarity takes over. Moving a bunch of people in a vehicle is relatively inexpensive. That extends to the notion that the higher the capacity, the lower the cost. For example, heavy urban rail transit systems are lower cost than light rail, and light rail is lower cost than bus. This may be true at capacity if the costs of construction are not too different. In practice, the evidence is otherwise. Another angel theory is that of avoided cost, providing transit is much less expensive than providing for increased automobile use. That is very situation-specific assertion, and work we have seen says that it doesn't hold very widely. At any rate, it makes assumptions about market growth and about unchanging spatial patterns of demand that are not very tenable. Somehow, we went from the assertion to the conclusion that we ought to be concerned only with transit operating costs. Fixed costs are of no matter because we would have had to spend at least that amount of money on auto facilities. This kind of thinking leads to the conclusion that BART, San Francisco's Bay Area Rapid Transit, is more efficient than bus because the fare box covers more of its operating costs and, in general, the nonsense that high fixed cost, low variable cost systems are always superior. Amtrak has taken such thinking one step further. At one time, it treated its subsidy as income on its books and claimed to make a profit. The notion arises that highly desirable, angelic urban lifestyles and urban forms will be achieved by transit development. Because of market segmentation, at some level, the notion has to be true. The issue becomes, for how many? If there were lots of people who find that to be true, then ridership growth would reflect it. Alternatively, changes in urban land uses and urban form would reflect it. Urban transit was pretty well developed by the 1920s, and subsequent further deployment has had marginal impact on urban land uses. As early as 1930, when transit services were provided, areas that were declining continued to decline. Where there was little change, little change continued and growing areas continued to grow. Even so, transit's favorable impact on urban development is the holy granzit of transit advocates, and they continue to look for it. Federal transit agencies funded study after study, and the Transit Cooperative Research Program has begun work in the area to no avail so far. A variety of views exist. Some hold that transit walking neighborhoods might be created with desirable social values. Demand is diverse, so there's certainly a market for such neighborhood developments. Issue the are those of size of the market and why private decision-making hasn't cleared such markets. If there is a market and there is some dysfunction constraining it, might there be room for policy actions? At a much broader view, there are those who advocate a return to transit-like cities in order to improve the quality of life and, in particular, deal with energy use and sustainability problems. Newman and Kenworthy in 1989 pointed out that dense transit-dependent cities use less gasoline than auto cities. The Newman-Kenworthy policy of returning to transit search cities has intuitive clarity to many, but it is not sensible. Why? As discussed, transit served the city of the year 1900 very well. 
Subsequent development of economic and social activity saw cities taking on more of an auto structure. The Newman-Kenworthy policy is much more than just a matter of substituting one mode for another. It has to do with reversing social and economic trends. They are tilting at windmills, trying to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. History does not repeat itself. This listing and debating of angel theories could go on and on. Important items to be included are reduced negative externalities compared to autos, reduced space utilization, favorable social impacts of an enabling transportation disadvantage to enter into social activities type, and expanding the energy efficiency discussion. Fourteen point five symbolic systems. The formation and use of myths are natural in human communication. Symbolic systems and images provide the tools used to simplify the complex world. The tools translate complexity to common sense and then provide a common sense basis for actions. What's wrong and what to do becomes simple and transparent. Richmond, 1998, applies the extensive literature in semiotics and linguistics to transportation. Richmond provides concise discussions of symbols, images, and metaphors. In brief, symbols are instruments of thought. They are partial information that can provide a gateway to a larger pattern or may be part of that larger pattern. For instance, a symbol on a map provides a gateway to the readers knowing that, say, a park or freeway is present. Such a symbol may also be part of the larger pattern. It may show the extent of the freeway network or of a park. The point is that symbols allow one to conceive objects, so once we see the symbol for a freeway, we see beyond the symbol to the larger object. A sign acts as an announcer. Enter freeway, curve ahead, railroad crossing, and so on. It doesn't always lead the reader to conceive the subject. It's quite different from a symbol, although a sign may introduce a symbol. An image is intertwined with a symbol. It's how a symbol is understood. One abstracts from the pattern brought to mind by the symbol using a calculus of images to make sense out of the complexity that a symbol represents. A symbol on a map brings forward the pattern of a freeway. One then understands that pattern using images that abstract from the larger whole. The image held by a pavement expert might differ from that held by a traffic engineer or an ordinary user. The Transportation Security Administration uniform brings the military and police to mind, even though their personnel lack the equivalent authority. The hope is, of course, that evoking the uniform of heroic officers will encourage airline passengers to comply. One tool we use is a metaphor, one thing standing in place of another. A metaphor permits our drawing on a variety of experiences and applying them to a new situation. We might say, for example, that Brunel did a Stevenson, the developer of the first railroad, when he developed steamships for the packet trade. That's very useful. It's a heuristic fiction that names, frames, and connects what Brunel did. The birthing, growth, and development and maturity metaphor is useful. Schoen, 1963, uses the notion of generative metaphor to describe the development of social policy. Participants in the policy process tell stories about what is wrong and how things can be fixed. These stories are metaphor-based, and the naming, framing, and fixing of problems reflect the metaphors behind the stories. In policy discussions, metaphors serve to cut through and organize complexity, and they also execute a normative leap. They pinpoint what is obviously wrong, and they make what to do also seem obvious. Richmond also addresses the myth that rail transit can alleviate the transportation problem of Western cities, Los Angeles in particular. What is a myth? Symbols direct us to particular conceptions of objects. Images form the impressions we draw about the objects, and metaphors frame and structure these. The result is a myth. Richmond's study involved interviews with political actors in Los Angeles, and he uses extensive quotes to show the images of trains. Powerful, go whoosh, straight through. He presents an aside on the sexual potency of the technological power of a train. A train is interesting because it is imagined as a she, as well as a penis symbol, inquiring into the way that symbols and images are organized in metaphors. Richmond refers to the organic metaphor so often used in transportation, arterials, free flow. He stresses the metaphor of the body and balance. The body and its transportation system aren't in balance or equilibrium because the circulation is congested. Trains are needed to get circulation in balance. We think that it is helpful to consider metonymies because they may serve as a building block for images. A metonymy is the use of the name of one thing for the name of another, and it is not the same as a metaphor. It is a contiguity association-based thing. For example, we may refer to America's land resources, although the land is actually owned by many people. Metonymies shape images. The rugged cowboy grins, sits on a horse in a beautiful western landscape, and smokes a cigarette. The cigarette takes on the name of the landscape. 
Automobile advertisements show sports cars going fast on rural California roads. Family cars are shown in the driveways of expensive houses. Sports cars have the meaning of going fast on rural roads, and family cars are the good suburban life. We think metonymies play a major role in shaping transportation images. Have photographs of BART with the Bay Area landscape in the background shaped mass transit policy? We think yes, just as photographs of the Shinkansen, new train, bullet trains, with Mount Fuji in the background and flowers in the foreground have shaped interest in high-speed rail proposals. We think that there are differences in the metonymies typically associated with the modes. A bus runs in a grubby place. Streetcars and trains run, are imaged to run, in a country or in beautiful suburbs and malls connecting to vibrant but not too crowded downtowns. Why do attitudes change? For example, as cars used to be good things, now they are bad. Perhaps that is because the metonymies change. In the early days, cars were much used for touring. They were associated with the countryside and were imagined as carefree exploration of the countryside. Cars were viewed as much superior to the train for touring. Today, cars and congested freeways go together, at least in the debate on transport problems of large cities. Some now argue that to be carefree, you must be car-free. Symbols direct us to particular conceptions of objects. Images form the impressions we draw about the myths and metaphors frame and structure these. Richmond says the result is a myth, but many political leaders and voters in Los Angeles say the contrary. When Darling in 1980 said, policy has been transformed into a kind of witchcraft, it seems he was commenting on processes involving Schoen's generative metaphors, the metaphors used to name and frame policy problems. Darling saw naming and framing as witchcraft. The use of the word witchcraft itself tries to reframe what was happening to policy to evoke an irrational brew where the output has no relation to the input. This metaphor is far stronger than that relating sausage making and bill writing, which suggests that you don't want to see it happen because at least there is a rational, if unsightly, chain from beginning to end. Because reasoning involves naming and framing, and that naming and framing is based on symbols, metaphors, and so on, the results of all reasoning must be myths. The results of reasoning are artificial constructs. That reasoning leads to the conclusion that all transportation knowledge and policy are steered by myth. Well, that conclusion must be true. It is destructive and immobilizing. If everything is a myth, why bother? Surely some myths are superior to others. While not generally agreed to, Richmond's and Darling's myths are superior to the wisdom generally held. The obvious answer is the analytic content of Richmond's and Darling's knowledge. Analytic knowledge lets us see many myths, such as railroad management tried to discourage passenger ridership, regulation was forced on the railroads, expansion of transit would be energy efficient, and so on. Who generates myths? Who is using metonymies, constructing metaphors, and engaging in the policy debate? Who is debating policy? White-collar urban planners and politicians engage in service activities and commute to congested office districts. The nature of their transportation problems and their solutions thus follow. Politicians adjudicate the interests of differing publics, so the balance metaphor may be especially appealing to them. Urban planners also have balance up front. They are attracted to certain metonymies and images, such as the right kind of urban landscape. Now, urban transportation planners use the urban transportation planning, or UTP, process. Process and equilibrium metaphors are valued. If trained in engineering, transportation planners have a classical Newtonian physical science worldview. Nature is orderly and exact. It doesn't change by leaps and bounds. Aristotle said about the year 300 BCE, nature does nothing in vain. Because, engin because non-engineers engage in the policy process and their experiences are different, we suppose that there are classes of myths, economists' myths, urban planners' myths, environmentalists' myths, traffic engineers' myths, politicians' myths, transportation analysts' myths, and so on. These are different modes, and these operate in different situations. We sense that these suppositions are true, but have explored their content only in a casual fashion. An important point is that it seems that some actors' myths have more authority than myths held by other actors, with authority varying from situation to situation. This speculation contradicts the statement above that authority is gained from the analytic content of myths. The contradiction is easy to explain. Analytic content appeals to some, such as the authors. Others give authority on other grounds. Fourteen point six discussion. One should not increase beyond what is necessary the number of entities required to explain anything. Sir William of Ockham's Razor. <laughs>
The observation that government steps in and does what systems cannot do for themselves is perhaps the simplest explanation for the situation in mass transit. The observation applies worldwide. Straightjacketed by high fixed cost militant labor organizations and regulatory constraints, by the 1920s, systems were having difficulty adjusting to changes in competition in markets. So local and or national governments began to acquire ownership to maintain the status quo. In the United States, local actions gave way to federal, as will be discussed in Chapter 23. This follows from the federal taste for large programs acquired when water resource, agriculture, and defense programs increased in the 1930s and 40s. With its monetary resources and the tilt to urban-based power in Congress, urban programs followed. With clamor from large city business, political, and transit labor interests, transit was there for the taking. Along with urban freeways and airports, it became one of several national programs leading to megaprojects. Analyses of such projects include reasoning about federal involvement similar to ours. So far, Sir William holds very well. It is easy to provide explanations for distorted project costs and ridership projections. The sometimes venomous anti-automobile transit first clamor, the willingness to use urban planning to try to control urban travel, and the use of ends justify means lines of pro-transit reasoning and analysis. It might be worth noting that highway builder Robert Moses once said, if the ends don't justify the means, what does? People value the status quo. Explanations that involve human avarice and efforts to impose planners' values on others are supplementary. Mass or public transit receives a lot of attention from political actors in the press, and many professionals think transit is where the action is and will be in the future. This chapter traced transit's middle age from maturity through decline. The argument of the devil versus the angel is very much one of style versus substance. By demonizing their opponents, angelic transit supporters aim to seize the moral high ground. Yet their arguments and facts are as mythic as their styles. This raises an important issue about the ethics of advocacy planning. If the supporters of the conspiracy know that the conspiracy is not really to blame for the loss of the streetcar, and we would venture some of them do, then they as planners are behaving unethically and using that story as the cornerstone in their arguments for new rail transit investment.